their future. Uh, to witness U.S. atrocities in Vietnam. In the back seat was a Nicaraguan woman by the name of Olda. She was visiting the U.S. for the first time. When she was a small child, she remembers eating only banana roots because her family didn't have enough food to eat because of the U.S. funded Ronald Reagan war. In the past two years, 200,000 people have moved to Portland from all over the country. Rents have gone sky high, just like other cities across the nation. Homelessness is an avalanche. Tents popping up like wild flowers everywhere. Streets are littered with trash everywhere. Arguments on many street corners. You can feel the stress everywhere. Anyone reading my words knows what I am talking about. In fact, I doubt if any, I, in fact, I doubt if I could say anything in this post that people don't already know. It's happening. You can't spend 50% of US tax dollars on the violent military Oh boy. this damn thing away. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. Dude. I hate it. I hate it. Shit happens, man. <laughs> uh, okay, um, okay I was, I'm going to steal back a little bit. Because I was, I was heading toward a crescendo here. <laughs> <laughs> and I screwed up. That's <laughs> okay. So, hey, I've done the same thing, so I'm, you can't, no. Don't, you don't own that. <laughs> okay. um, you can feel the stress everywhere. Anyone reading my words knows exactly what I am talking about. In fact, I doubt if anyone could say anything in this post that people don't already know by heart. It's happening. You can't spend 50% of U.S. tax dollars on the violent military without eventually turning this country into an economic war zone. So, Mike, what's your point? My point? The world is finally getting even. The scream is finally being heard. The next piece is, you know, these are both experiences I had. So I'm, you know, both of the pieces I, the, the piece I just read was an experience. The next piece I'm, that I'm reading is called Remembering Columbine High School. Okay, and I, as a photojournalist, I have taken many, many pictures of boys with guns, pointing them at people. Okay. In, uh, I remember in 1991, you got to remember this is after the, after the Gulf War, Desert Storm. God, I hate that freaking phrase. Anyway, here's these boys. They're 8, 10, 12 years old, and they're on three flatbed trucks. And their parents are on the trucks. Mothers, not just, mo not just fathers. And they're putting them in place. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, bales of hay on the, on the flatbed trucks. And these trucks are going to go out, and they're going to be in the Veterans Parade in Albany, Oregon, 1991. We all know what happened in Desert Storm. This is a picture. Um, I, I took three of them. I, I didn't bring the other two, but I'll explain them. These are boys pointing guns at me as I'm as they're about to, there's the flatbed truck. Let me hold it up first still. This is a picture of, of boys on a flatbed truck as, as, their, um, as their truck is about to join the parade, okay? And, and I, I, would, I would hope that you can, if you want to look at these pictures up close, you've got to look at the expressions of these boys. 
This picture here is a boy of about eight. He's got his mouth open. I took another picture of him. He had a pistol in his hand, and he was pointing it right at me. And what was so scary about that goddamn photograph was the look at his face. He had the look of killer. Nine years old. I took another picture, and the boys on another flatbed truck, and they had rifles in their hands. Okay? And you know, I was raised in the military. My father was a career military officer. He was a combat veteran in North Africa. He was involved in the retaking of Kazarine Pass. So I was raised on military bases. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into military bases and my dad was driving the car and there was that officer sticker on the front and there would be the, the, be the, the, you know, the, the guards at the post and they had silver helmets on, they had jump boots on, they had taps on their boots, they were fucking strapped. And they, when my father went through with that car, they put their hands up to their, like this, and they cracked their heels and saluted my father. And I thought to myself, Jesus Christ, my father is a god. Okay? That's the boy that was raised in the military. We were, in, we were the first dependents to arrive in Japan after the war. I arrived in Japan in 1947. My father had a top security clearance. And what they were doing is they were preparing to go into the Korean War. This is called Remembering Columbine High School. Two days ago, I pulled into a convenience store, parking lot, to buy a sandwich and get something to cold to drink. I had been listening to the audio book called A Mother's Reckoning, Living in the Aftermath of Tragedy. It was a book written by Sue Klebold the mother of Dylan Klebold, one of the shooters at Columbine High School on April 20th, 1999. Twelve students and one teacher were killed that day. Twenty-one other students were injured, some paralyzed for life. Since 1990, there have been 183 school shootings across America. Both Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold committed suicide after the massacre. If their propane bombs had detonated in the cafeteria as planned, possibly 200 more students would have been killed. I had listened to about 80% of the book. As a photojournalist, I have always been interested in why boys are fascinated with guns at such an early age. I have photographed boys playing with plastic guns and have used these pictures in photo essays. I was raised in the military. My father was a career army officer and World War II veteran. My father killed German soldiers in North Africa. Like millions of boys of my generation and generations afterwards, I played with plastic guns as a child. Over the years, understanding toxic masculinity has been, very, has been a very important subject for me to study. I personally think toxic masculinity is responsible for killing more men than all the diseases combined. <laughs> show me someone who is consistently aggressive, and I will show you someone who's hiding something. Show me a man who can't feel his feelings, and I'll show you a tombstone. I have come to believe what is hidden is profound. Anger and grief. You do not expose your suffering, no matter what, because that is perceived as weakness. The last thing a boy wants to feel is shame, because this powerful emotion is lethal. I have seen it kill many of my friends and acquaintances during my, four, during my 74 years of living. After I parked my car at the convenience store, I listened to a couple, I listened a couple more minutes 
of the audio book. As Sue Klebold was talking about eventually meeting some of the students her son wounded in the school library. I turned the engine off and entered the convenience store. I gathered up a few items and was headed to the cash register when I noticed plastic pistols for sale at the end of the aisle. They were half size and there were four different models. For some reason, I stopped and took a picture of with my cell phone. When I went to pay for my items, I changed my mind and decided to buy one last thing. When I went past the toy gun display again, there was a boy about 10 standing and staring at the toy pistols. He stood there for several minutes without moving, contemplating the guns. He then reached out and grabbed one of the toy guns. I followed him to the cash register as he paid for the plastic pistol with four individually folded $1 bills. I closely watched the transaction between him and the young man behind the cash register. I wanted to say something to that boy and tell him not to buy the gun. Several years ago, I stormed out of a video store when I saw a large poster of Mel Gibson holding a pistol. I yelled at the video store manager for, for displaying such a horrible image. I wanted to say to this 10-year-old kid that I saw American teenage boys die in Vietnam for corporate greed. I wanted to yell at everyone in that convenience store that I, that I, that I stood next to a ditch at My Lai on the 50th anniversary of that massacre where 170 civilians were slaughtered by American soldiers on March 16, 1968. Altogether, 504 innocent civilians were murdered that day. I met Ron Haverly, the combat photographer who took those horrifying photographs that were published in Life magazine. In 1980, my PTSD took me to a padded cell of a psychiatric hospital because I was so filled with betrayal and rage. Since 1990, there have been 183 school shootings in the U.S. There are over 300 million guns in the United States. Since the end of World War II, the U.S. government has bombed 30 countries. There has not been one day during the Vietnam War where the United States military did not commit an atrocity. Not one fucking day. The U.S. Was, government was responsible for 26 million bomb craters during the war in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Watching that 10-year-old boy buy that plastic pistol at that convenience store broke my heart. It broke my, my heart. A few days before I left Vietnam, I was the first on the scene of a, when a 19-year-old American soldier blew his brains out with his M16. I had blood all over me. The cannon fodder you raise is the cannon fodder you bear. Every time you buy a boy a toy gun, you bury his soul. I remember Columbine High School from the senior prom to Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, person happens to be our host, Hollis Higgins. Yes. from our chapter right here. Mm -hmm. Hollis, are you in the room? I think but right I saw you come in. Right there. Hollis will uh, uh, come and join us and, and, and present your art form to us. Yeah. 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 And this is for you, your book.
Yeah, poetry is supposed to be distinct language to bring people to a higher consciousness level. That is something that's hard to do. What's even harder as a poet or a writer or a speaker or a worker for peace is peacefully working for peace is to be honest in what you see and present it. My problem is I wrote a poem that I don't think is very uplifting. And uh, it's meant for two people. So if there's any female person who can do a cold reading, I need help. Because <laughs> this poem is written for two people to speak, and that's why I have two copies. Can everyone hear him from here? No, no, like, yeah, well, there you go. There you go. Thank you. Oh, okay. There you go. Eat it. Hello, everyone. <laughs> this poem came to me over a period of time, and it's called Refuge Under 5G Cold Ash Sky. On the last day, dim sunlight shone. Electromagnetic force fields abound. Placing dull silhouettes onto rock walls. Waves beacon through our bodies, every cell. Ponderosa bark glowed amber tones. E. Musk says, we must become part, AI. No wind carried harsh raven calls. When all becomes 9G, no one will tell. The hub branches whipped away. The overheated sky burns frost and ice. Gray memories, our sweet curled cat. CO2 and methane gas collide. <coughs> Not one wise word the hour left to say. Androids greet our faces in the glass. Porridge crusted cups? That was that. Cockroach and ant will eat this paradise. Our dreams painted plastic splayed clouds. Now the squirrel races to its tree. Coal colored silent twilight skies. Great hawks and eagles descend final flights. Minutes counted heartbeats, midnight's shroud. Ten million worlds will end this cold, harsh day. Released from rocky, frozen ties. Eternity will tend this final night. Thank you. Our next uh, reader of his poetry is uh, is Russell Johnson, uh, who is from Asheville, North Carolina. And Russell, would you like to join us and, and read your untitled poem, or? <laughs> Thank you, I'll work it out. 
Uh, now, I, I, I don't know if I can follow what I just followed, but we'll see what we do. And it's an honor to be here again. Thank you all for doing what you do, but it's really about the people that you see and those that you don't. Speak up, please. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll make it look. Now, can you hear me? Baritone. Okay. Uh, give it to us. Now, this is untitled because it's what you, you make it, you made it what you want it to be. It's, it's the only way it's going to happen. Because you don't want to move your finger. Well, somebody else could, but you know, you don't know what you should. Check this out. I can't see, so I can't. I'm going to try to read this and make it right, but good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. No, I said good morning. 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 Always somewhere, someplace on the Earth's face, we share this planet with others you may not see, others that you do see. Under the sun, under the moon, and occasionally, they share the sky. Think about that. If you blink, you will miss it with your left eye. And in unison, the cycles of the celestial movements, let us not destroy our streams, lakes, and seas, universally sanctioned that life and land are to be held in the realm of the sacred. Some eat lunch while others give, are gathered up into the cages and displaced in tents, camps, if they're lucky. And they're in a bunch. Classified as collateral refugees, damaged if parties, those targeted for the, for the mass genocide. Oh, by the way, did you get any cheese? Think closely, pay attention, you'll understand after I finish this plan. Now it is light that I can't see my bad has happened to my sight. But anyway, sometimes you can't see it me work it out. You, you all know I see a lot of glasses out there and contacts here me too. So it's alright. I'm just like you. <laughs> Seriously, question this yourself. Is your life more sacred? than the earth. Mm. And the rest and the rest of the and the rest of the inhabitants of this uh, dwell within this atmosphere. And what did I hear you saying yesterday? I cannot cannot reconcile with the books. So why these strange looks? Listen and pay close attention. The word, the word ordinance guides your, guides you and you're not always ethically, you're not ethically or moral municipality speaking in rules in which you, which for the social exclusionary standards of another's belief system. When the eye is removed, like unfortunate humans and all other life forms, ordinance is a life, is a life taker and used to change the landscape for your convenience. So I'm, 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 in, I'm into the humans and the 
different planets, so you probably figured it out. <laughs> but I'm telling you, what I did to make you slow and think twice. And I don't believe in rolling those dice when it comes to humanity. That's my addition, that's what I added in, because I only did one poem. I didn't know I could do two, so we're going to let you hear both. So don't worry about it. But I'm not finished. See, you thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> said, teach me to walk the soft earth as a relative to all that live. Give me the strength to understand and the eyes to see. And I found that and decided to put it on the cover of the book because I thought, in my judgment, that it was so close and so, so uh, significant for what we are here for today. And, this one this weekend. Our next reader is new to me. I, we we just met, and this is uh, uh, Renee Marie, who uh, sent me four poems, I believe, three or four, and she has a program for you tonight. Wow, my heart was in my throat, Mike, wherever you are. Really, really intense. So I think I have a voice that will carry in the room. Yeah. Is this okay? No. No, it's no. not enough. It's not loud enough. Yeah. Raucous. I do not want to stand behind that thing. It's just not for me. Okay. So imagine that you're holding in your hand a two-inch piece of barbed wire. It's rusty. And in this poem, I use the word God. I'm agnostic, closer to atheist. I'm coming out of the closet. <laughs> but in this poem, I use the word God for a specific reason. 2005 with the Army National Guard. Crybaby, Yuma, Arizona. On the border patrol mission, I stole a rusty barbed wire from God's desert. 115 degrees, Yuma, Arizona. 
just one quarter mile south of my army shade tent, where the new wall is still being built, and I am a servant, warrior, atheist. Why does self-determination require maps drawn in blood and pesos and dollars, preludes to the hundreds of empty water bottles, babies fall in shoes, and weathered handbags all pointing toward the hope of freedom's path? I feel the pledge of allegiance pulsing throughout my body. My chest expands right there, contracts right there. Feeling the vacuum of a dream swell, I yield to ancient tears. I peel the Velcro-backed American flag off the shoulder of my uniform and press it to my heart, where I can still see the Earth flag waving in all the other colors, languages, and hope. I held the fallen, rusted, twisted metal fence piece and pressed it too, hard against my heart to feel its songs of the many, all lunging over the still hollow wall, leaving behind <coughs> veils of flesh wounds. I heard the chorus of cravings all in Spanish tongue. I couldn't just leave it there. Their history? Without a grave? And still, I squeeze and bleed and listen and rewrite the world pledge to include everyone. Some say, I'm too sensitive to be an army officer, too idealistic, a crybaby of sorts, because I just tear up for pledges of allegiance to dignity, no vengeance, to peace, no privilege, and now, I want to wear this two-inch barbed wire around my neck with my dog tags, but I might get tetanus, compassion, or empathy, and further damage government property. That poem was written on the Border Patrol mission in 2005. Yeah. So he printed these, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read them, okay? Thank you very much. This is such an honor. It's my first Veterans for Peace convention. Welcome to the family. This one was written for Columbine as well. And I sent it to them. I had them, this poem printed on shirts and I sent it to them. And it was that same year that I visited the World Peace Sanctuary in Wasaid, New York, at the time I was living in Connecticut, and a full-time speech and language pathologist in a high school, and I found out about Columbine. And I wrote this poem and sent it to them, and I started putting peace polls on school campuses. Who was in my presentation today? Okay, that's the peace polls for schools project. I do have small little flip books with these poems in it and a few others. I have like 15 with me. And just two bucks, if you want to buy one, would help you pay for that printing. That's all. You see me later if you want to. All right, peace is a verb. Doing peace inside yourself means first wrestling with your own demons. Memories do not own you. Injustice does not justify more crimes of hate. Make peace with your demons. Make peace with your memories that injustice come back to the human family ready, confident, honest, open, and hopeful. Come back eager to share ideas we can live with. We need everyone to be fully engaged and present. Peace is a verb. This one I wrote at Standing Rock. 
I was still in the military, and I went. And I found the Veterans for Peace. I've been a, a warrior in the lion's den for 20 years, you guys. I retired in 2017. It, it takes a toll on your soul, right? But I stayed in to be a peace warrior. Okay. Right on. And first a PFC. So I did all that. All right, indigenous harvest, broken treaties and trust. The Anglos arrived curious, sickly, and hungry. They learned to farm ancient fertile land. They learned to share, to trade, treasures, blessings, disease, false promises, and fragile forgiveness. They returned again and again to their most inhumane abuses of power and cultivated a malignant mistrust. Peace. I wish I were a poet, I'm not. Uh, but you, you folks always blow me away. Your, your feeling and your thoughts. The next person uh, in the book is Rusty Nelson. Uh, is Rusty here? Rusty, come on up. And this book is for you, and if you want to read from it, or yes, have you memorized it? Oh. Okay, fine. Beneath the surface. Thank you for your surface, sir. <laughs> I've been needing something strong to stand upon, to write upon, to lean against, in case the world shifts again and jerks. Thank you for your surface, dude. I want to try a little surfing myself. <laughs> but it took me too far from my comfort zone and seemed too costly for the perks. Thank you for your surface, ma'am. I'm sorry it didn't work out better. For some of you sweet young patriots, somehow in the way when fighting men had to have a break. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your surface, son. It's really hard to know you'd only scratch the surface of a life some more, somewhere, sometime was bound to take. Service on its surface seems a noble thing, but take it from a vet. Servant warriors who destroy or wound or kill or die rarely know just whom they serve or how or why. decided to try to do something short. Uh, so I could read two poems. <laughs> I want to, uh, to welcome you uh, to Spokane. I've lived in this area since 1981. And I should mention somebody right now that uh, some of you old timers may remember, Sean Daly brought Veterans for Peace West. He founded, yes, Presente, uh, chapter number four in Colville, Washington, and introduced me to Veterans for Peace. 
and uh, insisted that we have a chapter in Spokane. And we had to do it because Sean would come down from Colville, which is about 70 miles north of here, halfway to Canada, <laughs> and he would drop by Spokane. None of us dropped by Colville. <laughs> so he's responsible for chapter 35 here in Spokane. <clears throat> and this begins by reminiscing as well. Fifty years ago, this old man was kind of young. Young enough to try to lead a platoon of younger men and boys. Old enough to know the difference between history and myth. Foolish enough to keep shouting into the rising noise. Wise enough to guess my enemy was like me, too young to die. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Our next uh, poem in the book is uh, by uh, Doug Rawlins. And uh, I noticed that there are friends from, of Doug's. Would someone like to come up rather than have me do it and, and read this poem? It's called, On Composing a Nam Bet. <laughs> Is there anyone who would like to I read? I would to read that. <laughs> OK, you, you know the poem? No. <laughs> but you'll, but I, I, think, I, I, I think you'll find this fascinating. You have it. I really miss it when Doug is not here for the poetry readings, and uh, some of us are fortunate enough to see his stuff online from time to time, or to have one of his books. On composing a Nam Fed. So I'll say they drafted me without saying who the fuck they are. So that's a problem. And what's a tour in the central of Highlands, Vietnam? Sound like to you? A cruise ship frolic? <laughs> <laughs> then take the word asset that officers used when they were talking about expending my buddies and me. Or how about R&R, &R, rest and relaxation? for drinking myself sick in some fucking King's Cross bar for a week. Then back home to the world, to the land of the flushing toilet, where I'm called a veteran in polite company, while potential employers discuss the possibility of me going post along. <laughs> <laughs> and don't even fucking start me on that PTSD thing. Here's the bottom line. We who served in your war are wrestling with identity crisis. Who the fuck was that crawling around in my skin? Eating away at my soul. All those months. Come home to find ghosts slurping. Sea rats in my family <coughs> kitchen. <clears throat> and how the fuck are we supposed to raise families built on dreams of a future brimming with hope and joy when there are no dreams? And joy is a dish detergent. <laughs> and all we can hope for is that our kids don't see us for what we work. Uh, I have a question. Is there anyone in the audience who will see Doug Rollins uh, in the near future? 
uh, would you be willing to give him this book? This, uh, this is a, and for those of you uh, who are not writers or, or are not presenting tonight, um, I have extra books, and, and if you're interested, come up and take a look at it. Uh, it's a nominal fee of five dollars, uh, just to pay for uh, the printing. But it's up to you. Okay. Oh. So <clears throat> the next uh, person in the book. Uh, and by the way, there's another poem from Doug Rollins within the book. Uh, is Arnie Stiver here? No. Arnie is not here. Uh, he wrote a poem. Arnie, Arnie uh, has written quite a bit of poetry. And uh, he wrote a, book, a poem that I'd like to read to you. It's called Stand Down. Outside the armory, on a clear May day, they stood waiting for their pay. Their shackles were gone, but their skin was the same. They had served their time. <coughs> they had played the game. <sighs> Groups of two, three, four, five, eight, filing the side, filling the sidewalks for hundreds of yards, humanity without homes, in the land of the free, in the home of the brave, in line. The new word is hero. Call them a hero. Recognition, pump them up, sign up, see the world, get in line. Haircuts and teeth and eyes, clothes. If you are early, if you are early part of the prize, medical checks, even a massage. Your service we thank with a hat from the branch of a tree with strange fruit that grows in a field used for killing fields. So is David Steiger here? Uh, this time we have a rather interesting, David is Arnie's son. And he wrote a poem on what it was like to deal with his dad coming home from Vietnam. He dedicated it to his father. You say it all came back in an evening in front of the TV, winter 2003. <clears throat> Iraq war about to start, platoon was on. You had no, you had not let yourself go there since 70. You let yourself go there that night. You say it all came back. You could see it, hear it, smell it. 9-11 might have triggered it. The invasion in Iraq rekindled it, but Hollywood platoon brought it back. Knew growing up you were in Vietnam, wasn't really sure what that meant. Knew you were in a war, but never discussed it. Couldn't play guns, cops, and robbers. G.I. Joe knew that this was the rule. Told some friends you were in a war, Another dad had been there too. He didn't talk about it. Heard he had changed when he got back. Didn't know if you had. Other friends asked about the guns you used, people you killed, like in the movies. Never did ask, still don't want to. So in 2003, you shared talking about it a little. I was 22 and felt like five, learning about it for the first time. Stories always pretty general, nothing too spe specific, keeping Vietnam <clears throat> at a distance. You had graduated college, got drafted, never thought you'd be about infantry, <coughs> stories of bomb, tr about, uh, basic training. You spoke with a clergyman in the army, you said, Killing didn't seem Christian. Clergy said, country first. <coughs> you were trained to kill targets that look like targets, targets that moved, targets like humans, humans that look like targets, humans that move, humans. Stories of Agent Orange, fragging of superiority, R&R &R in Australia, 
Christmas and Nam so you could come home quicker. Slurs for the enemy. <clears throat> How soldiers used women. Coping mechanisms to keep sanity. Before you started researching, reading questions, a friend, farmer, or soldier told you not to go down that path. Let it be. But you had to go down that path. Now you speak, write, converse, you talk to soldiers home from Iraq, Afghanistan, stories from them too, like yours. You see their, their ghosts. Motivates you to talk to teens about the realities of war, military. Some people don't want to hear your voice, words, writing. Say things like, your dad is the only soldier I know who feels like that. Other soldiers they know don't talk or complain about war, death, killing. They don't know other soldiers back from war are killing, overdosing, abusing themselves. War veterans have the highest suicide rate. You told me you thought about it. Soldiers are trained to kill, survive war, not retrained on how to survive after war. So many don't talk, you tell me. America teaches that war is necessary. Many soldiers must believe what they did was necessary, yet you speak out. Many soldiers fear saying the things they did, saw out loud. Fear of saying what happened may make loved ones distant. That no one can understand what was normal unless they were there. You teach me that for a soldier to speak out against the war is difficult. You say war is slavery. In, in 1970, you had three choice, choices, jail, living, leaving the country, but knowing you couldn't return, or war. You said you weren't brave enough for the first two. People need to know this, so you speak. I know if it's not easy to do what you do, but I thank you for the difficult path you chose. Soon, I will be a dad. I have your path to follow. It's easy to sit back, believe what you are told. It is difficult to do what you believe. At 22, I started becoming a, a man because you started teaching me what it means. This was David Steiber. Is anyone going to see Arnie or David? If so, uh, I'd like to uh, 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 give you a couple books to take to them. Would you be willing to do so? Thank you. Uh, so, is Bruce West here? Bruce West. He wrote a poem, all, At All the Garden Gate. She walks in the earth, up to her knees, beside him in a battle, riding shotgun on his soul. Rain on the window, they spoke without a word. He pledged his life to her. She promised to be true. The weenies just roast, hot fire, marshmallows thrown in, burnt, blackened, crisp. It looks a lot like him. Now he's a stranger at the garden gate. A stranger at the garden gate. Could she still love him? <coughs> what was left of him? Hadden, a bloodied hand, someone she once knew. Does anyone know uh, 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 Bruce West? And if so, would you take the book? If not, I'll mail it to him or find a way. Is Victor White here? Victor? <laughs> For you, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hi. So I will um, introduce briefly. When I was in Vietnam, I never experienced anything like fratricide, and yet it 
Ken Pendleton, I had a senior NCO that had. He'd been fragged and had uh, um, traumatic brain injury. So this poem is in honor of that person, but particularly in honor of the um, a fellow was found that went through our basic training at Quantico, who was very serious about Christianity, and this poem's about him. The Buddha's Inferno. The day started calmly enough, with really nothing new, except that the men, it seemed, gave him a worried look, a look he vaguely knew. But the lieutenant prepared, as he always did, by reading what he always read, and thinking what he always thought. A few more months, a few more days, he prayed he would not be dead. So where would they go today, he wondered, as he hurried and thought about his wife and all the good they would do. But why were the men so worried? The ride out went well. The men quickly found cover, but as they did, the lieutenant went one way and the men went another. Then there was fire all around and the pagoda that was near was sheltered for the men, but there was none for the lieutenant and all he knew was fear. Alone, he sought help on his knees, he ripped off his pack and searched for something. And just as he found it, a book, the round tore through his back. For William Paulson III, there would be no suffering or time with his wife or good to do or anything. And why were the men so worried? What a waste of life. I want to ask if anybody's been back to Vietnam in the last five years. Oh, well, I just happen to have a poem. <laughs> this is titled Everywhere. When Ber Bernard Fall wrote Street Without Joy, righteous violence was converting a nation into two nations with more war to follow with more hard times for all. With another book in mind, he went out that clear, hot day, this time with American <laughs> Marines on patrol. This time, he did not come back, as the Viet Minh had become Viet Cong. But the two nations became one, working toward a livable world for all, where clear, hot days still prevail, but now with Nikes and Hondas and iPhones everywhere. I don't remember names very well at times, but I received four poems, and these four poems were written by men and women who had lived, who, had, who were Palestinians, and who, had, who, had either, who were living in Palestine or had lived or had moved to other areas. And I would like to invite those who will read from these uh, poems there are four poems, Comfort Zone by Basman Dorari. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. I'm, I apologize. Prayer Musings by Mohammed Arafat. A Dream of Soaring by Hanin Zahot. And A Dream of One Magical Nine, Night by Azmai. I'm sure that's not the way to say that. Taya. And would, who, how many will come up and Come on up. Okay, and... I wouldn't mind reading one of those dream ones. Okay, sure. Well, okay. Um, <coughs> go for it. Yeah, we... Yes, please do. 
a dream of soaring. She draws her legs up to her torso, folding her arms in an embrace. Turning the fantasies of romance, she turns to sleep. <clears throat> but burning stars behind the bars hold her wistful eyes. She dreams of being a goldfinch, not a fragile damsel in, in a fantasy. She flies closer to the land, her land her goal is to reach the horizon, the silver lining in the sun rising beyond the clouds that never sink. A whisper invades her dream. Why would the soldiers fire at me? If I cross the boundary, she refuses to confront the reality in her thoughts. The soldiers don't exist. The statistics don't exist. She can think only about the sunlight flashing against the empty fields, casting the shadow of her wings upon the golden dome of her mosque, gleaming from her wheat fields, glimmering from her olive trees. She can think whatever she wants. She can make boundaries disappear she can make giant waves, swallow the occupier's ships. She can make this all disappear in the dim blue light of her room. The last reflections of war on her walls, the collection of broken frames, the tears shed from tear gas, the borders, the occupation, the dream sweeps her up. The dream sweeps her up in the arms of hope and dips her wings in the colors of life and love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please come up and, and, and pick a poem that you would like to read from this, this uh, group of four. Please. Okay. <coughs> Do you know it by heart or here's the book? I'm not going to read a poem. Two other people are, but I wanted you to know that in Gaza, um, there is an American woman named Pam Bailey who seven or eight years ago began an organization called We Are Not Numbers. And the Point, the reason for this organization is to give young people in Gaza some kind of hope and an opportunity to speak to the world. So John has been generous enough to let um, you hear some of their poems tonight and we'll read two more. Thank you. Hi. This is from Basma Dorawi. He's a physiotherapist for the Ministry of Health in uh, Gaza. It's called Comfort Zones. A wise person once said, great things never come from comfort zones. I find myself nodding in recognition. I never thought I would be a writer, but Gaza is making me a fighter, a fighter with a pen. It's harsh to live inside a prison, but where else awakens the tiger within? Her knees are buckling, but she still stands. She's riddled with disease, but still bursting with spirit. She is choking, but is determined to breathe, to live. Perhaps you should introduce yourself. I'm Kittredge Kit Kit with U.S. Boat to Gaza, Veterans for Peace, uh, Freedom Flotilla Coalition, and numerous other organizations. Okay. This is a poem from Amnia Ghassan. She was born and raised in the United Arab Emirates, but moved to Gaza. Uh, bachelor's degrees in English literature, and won a literary prize from Energia in Italy. And um, this is her poem. Pretend it's thunder. 
One rocket comes, another goes. The windows and doors shake so disturbingly. My two-year-old niece runs to me scared, trembling at how loud and sudden are the sounds. She looks at me and says, what is this? I hold her in my arms and caress her hair softly, trying to keep my tears from raining down. I whisper, almost like a lullaby. It's thunder, baby girl. It's thunder. It's going to rain. She points at the doors and looks me in the eye. But I don't want it to rain. I take a deep breath and continue caressing her. Neither do I. Zaid would like to read one of the poems, and at, at that point, Anne will read a poem by Jay Wink, who, as you know, uh, is deceased, but was the second poet laureate. And he won a national first place for a poem that Anne will read. So Zaid will read one more poem from a writer from Palestine. Aswan, my, my niece's name. Oh, OK. <laughs> and, and then Anne, and then, don't go away, because we have many, many people in the audience who will read. And, uh, and we will st I will stay until tomorrow morning. It doesn't matter. This, and uh, I, I hope that you will stay with me. That's up to you. OK. My first niece's name is Asma. My older sister's first daughter was born in Saudi Arabia anyway. So this is Asma Taye, a Palestinian. A dream of one magical night by Asma Taye. My brother lives in Brussels and so do I dream. Along the streets of Brussels, among singing troubadours, car homes, lovers, laughter, and sidewalk conversations. My tongue utters nothing but my eyes see everything. Even my own thoughts, memories of cursed love stories. Their plots cut short by broken traditions. Their characters imprisoned by high fences that separate them like wide oceans from freedom and hope. My feet carry me down another street where darkness brings me back to where the wind blew out my candles, in windows that open to nothing but fragments of melancholic tales, where a child's greatest wish is a zoo with an elephant, a lion. A llama, a beast to prove the world beyond the fence is real, where a meeting makes takes place in paradise with the lost father or a mother. With the lost father or mother, or meals are held with a grandma, never known. And a love story ends in happiness. My lips move for, without forethought whispering, have mercy on the soul of my city. Long minutes passed before I awakened. My mother's call woke me from my dream. Of that night walk in Brussels, my homework lay spread on the floor. Neglected study notes sparked my remorse. And I stayed up all that aching night asking the stars whether I should tell my stories and dreams to a world that seems not to care, or play the unbreakable, stoic heroine as Gaza demands of me. Read by Muhammad Zahid Chowdhury. Thank you. OK, for the book, to end the book, before we go to all of you, um, this is a poem by Jay Wendt. 
Passport Laureate, first prize in the 2017 Heroes Voices National Poetry Contest, and Anne has agreed to read it. Please. Well, I wasn't quite sure what I was agreeing to before I did it, but here it goes. Gregory, nicknamed Raj, from Bangor, Maine, a vet of Iraq, hooked up vacuum cleaner hose to his car's exhaust. These are today's dead veterans. There were others yesterday. Living alone in a fifth floor walk-up on East 111th Street in New York, Antoine raised and flew pigeons from his rooftop chicken wire and slatted frame cage. As he plunged into the backyard, he took out several clotheslines. There was Irv, Helen, George, Harold, Rennie, and Harry. Harold was gay, was called Roxy among his friends and he used a knife. Frenchy never made it to the post office. That's where he told his wife he was going. He drove head on into the side of a concrete bridge abutment on Route 66 in Arizona at 120 miles per hour. It was a clear, bright morning. A Lieutenant Cabanaro took his 45 along on a hunting trip upstate in North Dakota. The medic, who used to shoot up prisoners with morphine, Garolos, saved up enough for himself. He injected it while on leave in Germany. Angel, a guard at our prison camp in the desert, was a huge, Smiling man, very friendly. After discharge, he got a job as a warden in a state prison near Biloxi. He hung himself in his second-hand RV parked in a shady cottonwood grove. There was Rudy, James, and Eduardo, living in ghetto flops in several different cities. They combined booze and pills. Reuben's father was an Air Force officer, so Reuben was born into it. Everyone called him, Hey, Rube! When off duty from guiding armed drones, he loved to go up with the paratroopers. On a flight yesterday, he pushed his way past the jump master. There was Bonnie, Vera, Eli, and Chris. Chris was trained to, be, to defuse mines. Last evening on patrol, he jumped on one in plain sight. The taxi driver, who took Vera to Chicago's railroad yard, reported that she was drunk. During the night, Juan in Nevada and Eugene in Colorado both walked out into their respective deserts, stripped in spite of bitter cold, lay down, cut their wrists, and died, looking up at the full moon. <clears throat> there will be 22 more tomorrow. Um, so, the way I've done this in the past, it doesn't have to be the same. If you have a better idea, shoot it out. But I'd like to start to my right uh, and go down, and if there's a poet, with, with a piece that he, she would like to read. Let's keep it to one, 
but don't go away because as soon as we've got to the end, we'll start again in the front and go until the very end when you have finished, not me. So, do I have any people that would like to read a poem from themselves, from their own writing? <laughs> um, I just want to say, I would like to, I want to use my voice to invite everyone this Pledge of Allegiance, or Pledge of Allegiance, I would invite everyone to make a copy of that if it's okay with Renee and send it to our senators and congress people oh. and see if we can uh, get a petition to change oh. our, uh, sure. our uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Oh. Larry, I, Thank you, you, brother. This is Larry Kirshner. I know some of you, I don't know all of you, but Larry, yes. he, he goes by the title, The Peace Poet. Um, awesome. um, this last Mother's Day, I was part of a group at the Bangor Submarine Base. We blocked the road to symbolically shut it down, and we were arrested for pedestrian in the roadway. So on August 6th, our mitigation hearing came up with the court, and this is the poem that I wrote to present to the court as my mm -hmm. statement. It's titled, In Court on the 74th Anniversary of the Atomic Bombing of the People of Hiroshima, While Living in a Minimum Security Prison in America Within a Larger Racist and Genocidal Crime Scene. <laughs> a 1942 poster titled This is the Enemy circulated in the United States following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Its racist purpose was to embody the entire Japanese nation as ruthless, animalistic enemy that needed to be defeated. Japanese Emperor Hirohito was caricatured as a literal monster in the 1942 Dr. Seuss cartoon. The subhuman depiction of the Japanese removed any human connection between the peoples of the two nations as the imagery of the time through political cartoons and propaganda posters debased the Japanese as subhuman apes and gorillas. Treacherous in nature, morally corrupt, mentally and physically less than white Americans. This viewpoint of the Japanese as subhuman and treacherous easily justified dropping atomic bombs on the people living in Hiroshima and Nagasaki who were seen as less than human, an Asian enemy to be feared, restricted, or destroyed. Japanese survivors of atomic bombings are known as hibakusha, meaning explosion affected people. Bodies burned in a flash from head to toe. The Yanola Gay, a B-29 bomber, dropped a little boy, a 15 kiloton nuclear bomb on the people early on the morning of August 6, 1945. Between 60 and 80,000 people died instantly. In my life, I have seen how easily, especially uh, how easily people, especially people of color, are called other, and thus are considered less valuable than those in position of power. The imperial thrust of American history reached a nadir with the monstrous use of nuclear weapons against the non-combatant men, women, and children of Hiroshima. Since that time, the U.S. has threatened to use even more powerful nuclear weapons against human beings we call enemy. Each Trident submarine carried warheads that would equal 5,000 times the bomb dropped on the people of Hiroshima. I cannot ignore the fact that our society is currently in a state of willful ignorance, willing to kill millions of innocent people just as easily as we killed thousands of innocent people living in Hiroshima. 
just as easily as I killed innocent people in Vietnam 50 years ago. Celebrating Mother's Day, May 12, 2019, joined with other heart-stricken human beings, briefly blocking the road into the Trident submarine naval base at Bangor, Washington, was a small action considered illegal by the state. However, it was established in Nuremberg trials that sometimes international laws must override national ones. Quote, the use or threat of the use of nuclear weapons is a war crime or an attempted war crime because such use would violate international law by causing unnecessary <coughs> suffering, failing to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants, and poisoning its targets with radiation. All individual citizens have an obligation and duty under international law to prevent war crimes, crimes against peace, and crimes against humanity." Unquote. This action was required of us by law, <coughs> by ethics, and by the compassion all humans owe each other. So the judge said, they gave me this black robe because I'm supposed to uphold the law, but I need to uphold justice in your first right and first uh, first amendment rights. And technically the fine is going to be sixty-eight dollars, but you need it five dollars. So um, let's see. Come right up, Mark. Yeah. Okay. I'm Mark. I'm Mark Fleming from Chapter 109 Olympia. I serve with uh, Larry, Dennis, and Zion. And I write mostly prose. Uh, about 20 some years ago, I shared studio space with a bunch of uh, artists and poets, and Vietnam was on my mind, and suddenly a bunch of poems came out. So this is one of them. It's called Comrade. I never really knew him, but he has been my companion for many years. Someone said he was a jerk. I can't say. All I know is that our brief time together left a lasting impression. You see, I saw him die. This death was not dramatic or heroic, just dumb. An accident in a war filled with many accidents. The difference was that I saw it happen. I saw him die. He fell out of a helicopter that was his ticket to safety. A medical evacuation for a minor cut, hardly even a wound a convenient excuse to get out of the bush. But nobody expected him to die. We watched him rising toward the chopper, envying his good fortune, each of us wishing that we were in his place. The chopper's big rotor slapped the air as it hovered above the mountainside, his turbines screaming, waiting to carry him back to safety. I saw the medic leaning out of the door. I saw the medic reach out to pull him in. I saw him put his feet on the skids. And I saw him fall away from the chopper. He fell abrupt, abruptly, violently, no slow mo effect, no eternity to reach the ground, just a rapid free fall and a bone crunching thud. Mere seconds ended his life at 19. His buddies wrapped him in a poncho and hooked him to the cable again. This time he made it, boots pointing upward as they disappeared into the open door. But this time was too late. The chopper carried away a corpse leaving us to our thoughts, black and evil. No one had wanted to trade places with him now. All these years I've remembered his fall. I've seen his body break upon that mountain. All these years his death has been my companion. I did not know him well, but he remains with me still. Even now, all I really know is that I saw him die. That seems to be more than enough. <laughs> Anybody here that hasn't read yeah. on, on this row? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm going down the row. Can I read uh, Felix Peralta's also? Absolutely. Mm. Introduce yourself. And I will. I'm Jan Ruman. I'm with the San Diego chapter and also with the chapter in Tijuana. Um, I only wrote one poem in my life, and it was written while I was waiting to get out of Vietnam. It was time.
time over time you pass so slow and that you pass so fast. And when you have long passed me by, I'll have no thoughts of you over time. Um, but Felix Peralta, Jr. is a uh, Army veteran, I believe 82nd Airborne, if my memory is any good, and he lives in Baja, California, he's one of our chapter members. And he wrote uh, a poem, Somebody, Anybody, Help Me. Felix, like many veterans who finds himself deported to countries around the globe that they, they were born in, came across the border into Tijuana about 12 years ago in a paper jumpsuit with no identification, no money, no telephone, living in a foreign land that he hadn't been in since he was three years old. He did speak the language, but when you speak the language in Mexico and you're born in the United States, they know you're not a Mexican, really. He says, only the strong-minded will survive the deportation. It's not easy surviving when you get deported from the United States, especially if you lose everything, family, which is the most important. The material things come and go. It's like a bad dream, but you're living it for real. Just imagine being born in Mexico and your family takes you across the border to the United States of America. You grow up, finish high school, then you join the armed forces. You serve the country because you were raised there. Life seems so beautiful. Your family loves you, and you love them back. You're saying this is life. Then after serving your country, you make a wrong choice. Or should I say, you break the law. And, you, and they put you in jail, and you go do your time, and then you go get deported back to the country where you were born. No money, lost in a world. Time went by so fast, lost, don't know what to do, what am I, what happened to me, drugs, alcohol, please help me. I'm not, I'm not too dirty to ask for it, I'm not too dirty to ask for a job. I hear my dad's voice, Felix, don't beg for money. You have two hands, two feet. Where, Dad? I'm too dirty. I can't do it, Dad. Dad, my heart hurts so much. I want to go back. Dad, but this wall won't let me. Felix, get up. Start walking and looking. Luncho Camino. I can't do it, Dad. I just want to give up and die. People are dying all around. It hits you like a sledgehammer, and you say to yourself, I should have done things differently. Alcohol, drugs, Help me, I'm lost in a world where I was born, but I don't know why me. The wall separates me from my loved ones, so close, but so far. Help, help somebody, anybody. Walking the streets of Tijuana with my hands in my pocket, looking down at the ground, lost and afraid to look up because I see a great big wall that separates me from my family. I want to forget, walking, walking, I can't get a job. I'm dirty. I haven't had a shower in days. I smell the rot. Their minds are gone. They walk like zombies. No direction. Am I going to be like them? Alcohol, drugs, please help me. I'm still the same. Lost in a different world. So close, but so far away. Maybe if I close my eyes, it will all disappear. No. Still here. Great big wall. Please. Somebody help me. Anybody, please. Would you give us a uh, okay, let's start from this end and not in the second row. Charles? Introduce yourselves as you come up and uh, please accept this is a book. Thanks, John. <clears throat> and thanks, Jan, uh, for bringing attention to that outrage that's occurring. Congress could fix this. There's legislation that's been introduced, and it was predicted to go nowhere, and so far it's gone nowhere. There needs to be a public outcry yes. to demand that Congress fix this. The uh, oath that uh, 
that took that military members take when they enlist, the enlistment oath is almost the same as the naturalization oath. And uh, Congress could easily say, if you take either of these oaths, you are a citizen. <clears throat> I'm Charles Powell, and uh, I'm with the Albuquerque uh, chapter, also proudly known as the Donald and Sally Alice Thompson chapter of Veterans. <laughs> And next year, uh, I think somebody else mentioned the VFP uh, um, convention will be in Albuquerque. Um, Albuquerque and Santa Fe are working together to plan that convention. Um, and the reason is that um, next year, 2020, will be the 75th anniversary of the bomb. And so there are uh, different organizations that are going to have major uh, events in New Mexico next year. So start saving. Save the day. I call this one bad wants company, so does good. When I feel the smallest, the weakest, the most insignificant and vulnerable, the most impudent, insecure, and unsure and unimportant, uncomfortable, saddened, my most dejected, deprived, discouraged, dispirited, disadvantaged, disappointed, depressed, ashamed, and unhappy. I'm also more likely to be suspicious, distrustful, fearful, angry, selfish, defensive, and bitter. My judgment of others is more apt to be insensitive, harsh, and severe. On the other hand, when I feel the strongest, the most significant, effective, <coughs> potent, content, fit, secure, forceful, and certain, my most important, confident, fortunate, satisfied, pleased, positive, and joyful, I'm also more likely to be consider considerate, pleasant, cooperative, friendly, forgiving, <laughs> trusting, calm, kind, and generous. This is Jim, Jamie. Jamie, and introduce yourself. And I'm Jamie Skinner. I'm a member of EFP 72 in Portland. I've been a member for about 10 years now of Veterans for Peace. And I'd like to share a poem that was deep in my soul about the what I consider the heresy and apostasy of the Christian church, of whom I consider myself a follower of Jesus. And yet, there's 80% of evangelical Christians who embrace philosophies that are completely um, anathema and opposite to what Jesus stood for, a man of peace. My poem is, War is Anathema. Resisting evil. Embracing peaceful love, doing good to those who hate you, trusting God above. Walk the second mile and turn the other cheek, listening and empathizing, grace we are to seek. Christians must pursue truth and life and healing. War, then, is anathema, deceit and death and stealing. How then can from our hearts spring water fresh and stagnant? To silently condone a war to us should be repugnant. At Nuremberg, they recognized a higher moral law. Obedience to wrong commands, a plea we cannot draw. When it is within our grasp to do that which is good, to bind up broken hearts, the task 
and by his power we should. But all too often we rely on someone else again. To ourself we fail to die, and therein lies the sin. Let us not hide neath a flag when country asks to maim our enemies with bomb and frag all done in Jesus' name. Neither let us hide behind a politic, right or left, that claims to elevate pro-life, yet funds war drones of death. Okay. Anybody on this? Uh, well, Mike, you've already been up, but next. Anything? TNG? Captain? Next, okay. Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is James Yee, and I'm from the North New Jersey chapter, VFP, and I served as a chaplain at Guantanamo Bay. I went to the army, I went to war. What the hell did I do that for? Mama, mama, can't you see what the army's done to me? They took away my faded jeans. Now I got my M16. It sounded like a good idea. Get a free education. Mine was the West Point indoctrination. Duty, honor, country. Yes, those things matter to me. Join the army and be all that you can be. The TV commercial said, we do more before 9 a.m. than most people do all day. The cadet honor code. A cadet will not lie, cheat, or steal, nor tolerate those who do. But as a US military soldier, can that really be you? Yes, sir, no, sir, just following the orders. Deploy you to lands where there really are no borders. You learn to fight, you learn to fire. And staying alive becomes your only desire. Stay alert, stay alive. If you want to come home, if you want to survive. I made it back, though it didn't go well. My return was by way of solitary confinement in a secret jail cell. It was because I didn't stay silent, too many truths to tell about how the prison camp at Guantanamo was a living hell. Operation Enduring Freedom. I just couldn't look away during my time, so I kept the journal log and reported the war crimes. They said, we're fighting, we're fighting terrorists now, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And the president says, Geneva Conventions don't apply. Taken away, they locked me up and said, you're one of them, aiding the terrorist enemy wanting to create mayhem. They labeled me a Chinese Taliban. Then get me with the death penalty, that was their plan. It didn't work, honestly, it was bullshit on a hook. I was, I was later set free with an honorable discharge I took and became the army veteran who authored this book. Yep. Yeah. For God and country, faith and patriotism under fire. It details what really went on at Guantanamo inside the wire. Mama, mama, can't you see what the army's done to me? I put back on my faded jeans and threw away my M16. I'm now a veteran for peace. I just had a thought, it's a good thing this is only once a year, the emotion is <laughs> okay, uh, where are we? Sarah Mess. Quick announcement, they're going to have the start of the movie. Uh, yeah. Where? Where? Yeah, up in the movie. In it. 
Oh, I don't know what that is. It, 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 and the uh, 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 sp uh, spoken uh, follow okay. spoken For anyone, follow exactly. Uh, for uh, for thank you, Mike. For anyone who, who wishes to go to that, certainly understandable. This is going to go on for a, a bit longer, a lot longer. Okay. okay. You, you. Thank you. Introduce. My name is Sarah Mess. I'm a veteran for peace from Jersey City, Chapter 21. Once upon a time, I was a terrorist in a nation of poets. Um, Tom Hanks will have you believe it was a nation of pirates. Um, this year, July 12th, marked the 26th year anniversary of the Mogadishu massacre, where I saw that happen in broad daylight, um, and Anne Wright heard it from where she was. This one's called White Girls from the Hood. Who that white lady? I drive through the neighborhood I grew up in all the time to see and hear my mom. A neighborhood I barely recognize. Cars parked on the street both sides. Painted crosswalks and double yellow lines. Not as many kids in the streets. Porches no longer filled outside. Sunny days in cumulus clouds disappearing behind rising parking decks and buildings on high rise. Blocking out the sky where I used to watch the Newark International Airport flights go by. Listening to the rocking motion of the New Jersey Transit Raritan Valley Line, even now it sounds like my childhood lullaby. Pushing up against the immigrants, the black people, and the poor, who I am, the only life I knew, and the person I was before the poverty enlistment, before the war. New neighbors who look and stare at me like I'm a jogger, coffee cup sicker, looking to move in for the first time with the gentrified. Guess they, what they say is true. You can never go home again. Not that I tried. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, come right up. All right. Come right up and introduce yourself. And this is a booklet for you. Thanks for sharing. I am a uh, pretty new member of uh, Veterans for Peace Seattle chapter, and it's my first convention, so it's probably hard to know. And uh, I was really excited about this convention. They said, well, there's going to be a poet sign. I was told there'd be a lot of energy there, a lot of vibes, a lot of emotions. I, I got to go. I said, well, why don't I write a poem? So I wrote a poem. And, um, I got it all done and I went to submit it and then this flash on the screen said the deadline for submission has passed. So I said, well, I guess I'm off the hook. But since you invited me, I guess I'm not off the hook. So here it goes. Uh, I'm a Vietnam War veteran and uh, this is my first poem. Uh, I titled it Training for War. And it's kind of an ugly poem. I don't know how to write a pretty poem about war. The instructor informed us that Vietnamese people have little regard for human life. He attributed this to the fact that most Vietnamese are Buddhists. To underscore his point, he showed us a film clip of a Vietnamese Buddhist monk self-immolating on a street corner in Saigon. To be sure, the instructor wanted to convince us we would be facing a ruthless enemy with no compunction against taking our lives. But it was a two-edged sword. For the hidden message was this. If the Vietnamese had so little regard for human life, then it was no big deal if we took their lives from them. So they sent us to Phnom to kill or be killed, and kill them we did, sometimes in great numbers, but more often in onesies and twosies. If they confronted us, they were enemies. If they ran away, they were enemies. If they tried, uh, if they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, they were enemies. If they tried to hide, they were probably enemies too. It made no difference whether they were young or old, male or female. 
body count was a measure of our success. <clears throat> I came home physically intact, but broken in spirit, and began a long and painful <clears throat> journey of recovery from post-traumatic stress. Along the way, I found Buddhism. Mm. Mm -hmm. I absorbed the Buddhist values of peace, compassion, and reconciliation. I adopted the Buddhist precept to do no harm. Buddhism was my pathway to pacifism. How ironic is that? <laughs> so, I think that's my uh, okay. Okay. This is my Oh, book. oh, okay. Come on up and introduce yourself and here's a booklet for you to my name is Heather Bowser, and I'm an associate member of VFP. Tomorrow I'll be speaking on Agent Orange, so please come and see me. This is a poem I wrote for my father this year. He's, he passed away in 1998. Campfire, the stars, and a Vietnam vet with PTSD. The damp summer night, the large fenced-in backyard, the chaise lounge, drug off the back deck, out to the fire pit. The white enameled smooth frame, plastic scratchiness of the removable cushion. The chaise, my position for stargazing with my father, or waiting till it's dark enough to hunt the damn rabbit eating the garden. Hasta la vista, bunny. <laughs> my good leg stuck to the non-breathable surface. Dad's shotgun by his side, the bunny's gonna die. The sky is so clear, we can nearly make out the Milky Way. Watch for shooting stars, Heather. Do you see that one at 10 o'clock? He points to imaginary clock face in the sky and takes a chug of his pass. Time stops. The fire pops and crackles contained in its sandstone blocks. Like my father's feeling of perceived safety in his backyard. This is truly him, the boy that was, before he went to war. My child self recognizes his awe and wonderment. His joy watching the summer night sky from meteors, his hope that I, too, may experience them. It's getting late. The fire's dying down, and the meteors have also slowed. Time starts again. Well, we didn't see that rabbit. Thank God, I thought to myself. Well, I've got one shell on the shotgun. Let's go to the back fence and shoot it off. I'm going to have you shoot it, he decides. We walk through the tall grass to the fence. Dad places the shotgun in my hands and instructs me what to do. He stands close behind, helping me hold the 12 gauge in my arms. He tucks it against my arm, clicks off the safety. He tells me to pull the trigger, and I do. The next morning, my arm hurts so bad. I look and see purple and green where the butt of the stalk made contact with my flesh. Outside, the ashes of our fire are still smoldering. I grab the chase lounge drag it through the thick wet dew back onto the deck. The containment is gone. So are the stars. The bruise on my arm will heal. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there someone on this side? Uh, okay, come on up. I've lost touch. I, I know where Heather, right? Yeah. Is, but or are you going out George? George, are you coming? Or? Well, I'll come after you. Sure. We'll have a little I'll sit right up here and I'll come up after you. <laughs> well, I, you respect age, don't you? I'm gonna, <laughs> well, then he should be up here, right? <laughs> I, uh, That's for you. I want to read two short ones. Who are you? I'm George Johnson. I live in. Uh, Flashy, Tijuana, Baja, Mexico, and I'm a member of 
chapter 182, which is mostly deported veterans, I'm self-deported. Oh. Somebody asked me not long ago, did I expect I would come back to the States anytime soon? I said, yeah, when they send a company of Marines locked and loaded with six-point restraints and a straight jacket and put me in a, in a paddy wagon and haul me across the border, then I'll come back to live in the USA. Because there's just too many goddamn gringos over here. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, I want to do two short poems. One I always do whenever I say poems, and it's about the night my brother came home from Vietnam. And it's called, Welcome Home. He came home. We walked on concrete sidewalks all night long till dawn's early light. Fred said, ain't never gonna slog through meaty mud in a rice paddy again. Then he moved home to his old room at Mama's house. And every night, the dreams came and the screams came. <clears throat> like a thousand wild horses stampeding through his brain. He'd wake up crying and screaming and pacing. And then one morning, over hot coffee with Daddy, Daddy says, son, you really need to get over what happened over there, because them dreams sure do upset your mom. Mm. Oh. I'm sure every definitely do. Somebody tell them, get over it, because you're upsetting me. <laughs> and, but anyway, this one I just wrote, so bear with me if it's not, not very polished. It's called Send Them Back. Congress condemns Trump, but not his white supremacist followers. I remember when it was, send them back to Africa, send them back to Mexico, send them back to any place else. And I also remember during the Vietnam War when they said, America, love it or leave it. And they s screamed and yelled at anti-war protesters, including Vietnam vets. I didn't hear one, thank you for your service, welcome home in those days. And uh, no one, uh, Wait a minute, I lost my place. No one told the uh, Italians who brought us the mafia to go back to Italy. No one told the uh, Dutch and English slave traders go back to England and Holland. No one told the uh, no one told the French who taught us to scalping so people could collect bounties on murdered Native Americans. No one told the uh, priests and monks who traveled up the West Coast forcing labor from the West Coast Natives to build their missions. They didn't ask them to go back to, to Spain. And on and on and on. But Pelosi finally got one right. She said, make America great really means make America white again. Well, I said that from the first, this ain't in the poem. I said that from the first time I ever heard it. But um, oh, make America white again. Stand up. For people of color, stand up for women, fight racism, white supremacy, and salute the four brave, courageous congresswomen who stood up for justice and sent Trump back to mar a <laughs> Okay, well, you're up. This is Don Blackburn from Vietnam. Well, I moved, back, I, moved, I moved back to the States so some time to watch Trump get elected. Oh. Okay, give me a second here to put these glasses on. I really want to read a poem that's, that I've never read before uh, in, in public. and it's, I wrote it a really long time ago, but it's sort of long. 
or uh, not real long. I, I could make three and a half or four minutes. That's really what I want to read, or I could read some other ones that are you would probably be okay with. But given what's been going on tonight, I kind of want to play into some other things that have been going on. So I'm going to go ahead and read the longer one. Good. Be patient, <laughs> please. Mike Hasty was up here, and he moved everybody very much. A long, 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 long time ago, I was a high school teacher in a place called Scappoose, Oregon. And Mike Hasty and a bunch of other vets called the Northwest Vets for Peace at that time were uh, coming into my classroom to give presentations on their experiences in Vietnam. Much to the chagrin, I might add, of my principal, the superintendent, and lots of other people, but I was a veteran, and the kids liked hearing them. You can imagine a 16, 17, 18-year-old student in a high school listening to Mike Hasty, and what you heard tonight is just how he spoke to those high school students. We got a lot of people coming out of the rocks. There was a student named April Mejias whose father was blown up in a half track in Vietnam, and she hadn't seen her dad in 25 years. And he was a heroin addict, a morphine addict from the pain. And because Mike moved her so much in the classroom, she got in touch with her father for the second time in her life, and he came to the classroom, came to our classroom. And uh, so at the same time this is going on, the military recruiters are hitting good old Scappoose High School very hard because it's 22 miles northwest of Portland. The Portland School Board had denied access to their students. Uh, they wouldn't allow uh, military recruiters to come into the schools. So it was wonderful for Portland, but then what happened? They started to come out to the working class suburbs like Scappoose, and man, they were thick. I would, I'd be trying to teach my class. I'd get a note from the, from the counselors that somebody had to go see the counselor. It wasn't the counselor, it was the military recruiter. Yeah. And they bring their truck in with the video games and everything, you know, and this kind of all the stuff's going on. And one time one of my students unplugged uh, the machine and hid the uh, wire. <laughs> All this kind of shit's going on in the little old scab hoose. And so they, they try to stop me and stop us by making up uh, different rules. We're terribly un-American. Like if somebody came into the classroom, you had to present the other side, whatever that was. Okay? And I just let anybody come in. I didn't care what they, a lot of times I didn't know what they were going to say. We had very few pro-war speakers, but I didn't, I didn't mind. But you had to allow the other side. You had to sign a paper. I had to sign a paper saying uh, just how far these people might go and how much trouble they might cause. And if they caused more than what I was saying, then I was in trouble. They tried all kinds of bullshit. And they had the military recruiters. So I wrote, this is an ode to military recruiters called Vampires in the Halls. <laughs> How many sides to the truth must the other viewpoint be presented if real life experience does not agree with preconceived personal political manifestos and bigoted ignorance? Ah, uh, the easygoing, swaggering, jingo, jango bravery of those who send the young off to carry out their deadly, domino-dropping, decadent dreams of dynasty. While their emissaries, freshly starched vampires, weighed down with meaningless metals from instant wars with bewildered adversaries, patrol the halls of institutional non-learning, knowing they will encounter no enemy, they make insidious promises that feed on the lack of hope, real education, while bombastic celluloid Hollywood images of Rambo, Chuck, and the Duke dance in their frantic, impressionistic brains. These vampires, they need fresh blood. And there are not many virgins left in this age of lust for all the deadly sins. But the vampires can spot them with special night scopes made, excuse me, special scopes made for nighttime forays into the fluorescent abyss of apathetic amorality. High school. Man, I'd like to drive a fiery olive branch of pure truth into each of their metal-encrusted harps, but there's nothing inside of the stiff uniform, no soul for the truth of peace to penetrate. Man, I'd like to truly educate the innocents so they won't fall prey to the vampires. It makes me want to pray 
We should all fall down on our knees and pray, for it would take a miracle to make the blind, scared priests of no controversy let the strong truth of light, light of truth, <clears throat> liberate the young without the other viewpoint that smothers truth in plastic Ziploc body bags full of the death stench of war. <clears throat> I spoke to another young one recently, eyes gleaming stars and stripes. He'd been fed the insidious line. It'll make me a man, he said. I'll get to see other cultures. I'll get money for an education. Well, I wanted to say to him, what are you now, 18 and still a child? I'd want to know why if I were you. Once upon a lifetime, I was. <clears throat> and what defines a man? One who lurks in hallways draining blood from innocence to keep the other viewpoint pipeline flowing. And child, that other viewpoint can kill you, whether it be with bullets, poisonous grains of sand, or the sins you'll be forced to commit upon them. <coughs> that other culture will be watching you, waiting, <coughs> waiting for something to fester and bloom within you, waiting for the right moment when your exhaustion and humanity finally weakens you, weakens you for that necessary instant when you least expect it. They watch you for signs, and they will watch you, and they will watch you forever. As for your education, I wish it weren't so damned hard to give it to you. The truth, I mean, do you realize yet that the other viewpoint still fills the higher ranks of those in charge of making sure the truth is kept under wraps? They keep you innocent for a reason, for where would the vampires feed if not for this guaranteed food source? Yes, guaranteed safe patrols, recons without fear of ambush. The truth is too controversial. They need a special form now to make sure the truth does not mistakenly filtered in, undetected in the guise of real life experience, in the words of living ghosts that ring so true to bring tears to the eyes and fire to the heart, I will hold my hands and pray. Fold my hand and pray. Pray that you will wait and think before signing your name in blood on the line. I will pray that you remember the truth of peace and let it guide you and protect you while the vampires shine their medals and hide their dripping fangs. Okay, next. Come on up, Dan. This is Dan Shea from the West Coast. Thank you. Here's a book for you too. Thank you. I'm sorry. Hey, uh, Dan Shea from uh, Veterans of Peace, Chapter 72. It was about a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago, in March 16th, that I was in Vietnam for the uh, 15th anniversary of the My Lai Massacre. I read that poem. I've, I've read that before. I, and just uh, last year also, uh, when I was serving still on the board of Veterans for Peace, we went to the border and to uh, uh, the deported veterans uh, uh, community, and I saw what was happening there. I wrote a poem about that. But most recently, the thing that's really, really tearing at my heart is seeing on television constantly our young men and women that have been in the border patrol tearing children out of the arms of their parents. That's fascism. That's fucking Nazism. And it, it breaks my heart, and then throwing them into, they call it, detainment centers, they're fucking concentration camps, and they're putting kids and babies and infants in there. And I don't know that I wrote this, that, that it was even that powerful, but I couldn't help write it. 
I just wrote that on July 18. I feel the weight of the state's oppression as the Iron Hill presses harder on all of our necks. I can't breathe. I'm suffocating by all the injustice, choking on the cries of babies being torn from their mother's loving arms, thrown into concentration camps. I am drowning from the tears of families mourning yet another black life murdered by the police. I'm losing consciousness as forever wars fill graves in genocidal waves. I'm dying because my heart is breaking and I'm not sure I can survive this hell. Or maybe I should say this shit. Thank you. Who's next? Come on up. Not me. Oh, I'm coming for a book. Oh, there's, they're in there. I'm Doug Nelson. I'm in San Jose now, and I joined VFP in Washington, D.C. The first guy to welcome me into VFP was a World War II veteran, and I had just lost my father. I think there was something to that. I came back to uh, my home in Virginia, where I grew up, mm -hmm. and I'll try to summon up uh, the accent I grew up with as I read this. My country. Ken Burns shook overripe peaches out of my tree. A soggy thump reminded me that when I came home from over there, people acted as if they didn't know me, and I think I no longer knew them. My comments about the children in my photos were met with, they're all just communists, right? Or they don't value a human life the way we do. As an inquisitive child, I found a Nazi belt buckle in my father's army box that said, words in a wreath, Gott mit uns. Dad had said God wasn't with him, was he? So I had to wait 50 years to find out if he was with anybody. Before the elfin man and the nice lady behind the video mixer confirmed for me that our leaders were either clueless or liars, I had suspected as much all along. I don't know my country anymore. The N-word is once again acceptable where I came from. They used to tell this adolescent boy that Jesus was sad when I looked at girls with lustful thoughts. And now the preachers tell me I'm going to hell for not accepting the casino king as my country's savior. <laughs> They've exchanged the torch the lady in the harbor holds for an extended middle finger, and the clown with orange hair is no longer funny. Do me a favor, y'all. Don't ask me to love another country. Mm -hmm. Who's next? Who's next? Who has not read yet? Uh, I want to get everybody a chance, and then we will go around again. Anybody else? You have something? No, I'd like to write a book. Oh. Do you have them? Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. If, if you have them, if you don't, like... No, 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 I, I have it up, but... Thank you. But, uh, is there anyone else who would like to read? Come on up. Yeah, and I, I, I want to say to you all, it's, it's late, it's 10, we started at 7.30. Yeah. Um, and I do appreciate those who remain, but I understand for others, they have other things to do. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I do have more books uh, for anyone who, who hasn't read, who wishes to have one. They're five dollars. And but, Ye, Mr. Yee. Yeah, James Yee. James Yee. Captain. So I, I think you'll like you'll like this one. Yes. Uh, the previous reader mentioned the clown with the red hair. So. <laughs> uh, this po this poem is called "What Is the Texture of Silliness?" What's the texture of silliness? And it, I'm introducing it with a disclaimer that this poem, uh, which does make mention of the physical address of the White House, 
is not necessarily a direct reference to any particular person who may currently live at this address. <laughs> who may have had been the inspiration behind the creation of this poem. <laughs> Definition of silliness. When a clown, professional or otherwise, moves into 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest, Washington, D.C., 10500, the address of the White House. The Oxford Dictionary definition of clown reads, a comic entertainer especially one in a circus wearing a traditional costume and exaggerated makeup. Synonyms, joker, comedian, comic humorist, wag, wit, prankster, jester, buffoon, wisecracker. Here's an alternate online definition, a foolish or incompetent person. Synonyms, fool, idiot, Dolt, ass, ignoramus, bungler, blunder, moron, meatball, bozo, jackass, chump, numbskull, numbnuts, nincompoop, halfwit, hoser, bonehead, knucklehead, fathead, butthead, bird brain. Scissors bill, twit, nitwit, twerp. Enough said. <laughs> Is there anyone who has not read who would like to? If not, I I took a class at uh, City College, San Francisco, called Labor Story and Song. And one night, the instructor Pat Wynn who uh, is a very good uh, lefty songwriter herself, she told us, said, anybody that can write a rap gets five extra points. So I went home and I wrote this. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. That's they right. came on a boat, called the grandma, Fidel, Che, and a handful, that was all, that upset Batista and all his thugs and the mafia bosses selling gambling and drugs. Batista looked to the north to get it stopped. But old Uncle Sammy got his big nose box, for sticking it in where it don't belong. Bearded ones kept fighting, kept getting strong. They took to the hills to organize. Pretty soon a revolution came alive. They fought, they struggled, shed their blood and tears. Then they marched to the Havana with it, to a course of cheers. But across the water, just 90 miles away, the Casanos were plotting with the CIA. They wanted to take back the people's land so they could rule over Cuba with an iron hand. They landed some thugs at Playa Gairon, but the people's militia took them home. They drove those thugs back into the sea so they could keep the island safe and free. Right. I got five points. And then I wrote another one and got another five points. Well, I don't, is there anyone else with anything they'd like to share? Please, Larry. Yeah. Thank you all for, yeah. for staying. Yeah. We'll give you five minutes of sleep tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. This is called TET 2019. In this year of the empire, 2019, February 5th, TET Nguyen Dan, which is Sino-Vietnamese feast of the first morning of the first day, may last seven to nine days. I remember TET 1968 when Despite Walter Cronkite, Westmoreland was claiming the war nearly won. After a firefight, I was patrolling on foot in the Central Highlands and found a Vietnamese man who must have had 15 bullet holes in his body struggling to ca crawl away. Being an American god, I felt that he had no chance to live, so I put him out of his misery with several rounds through the head. Cronkite said, the only rational way out would be for us to negotiate, not as victims, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy, who did the best they could. Oh. Sarah, Sarah's, was we... Yeah, Sarah. I got a positive one. So we can okay. Well. 
Sarah Vest. Oh, okay. And then Europe. Okay. So uh, just this is uh, these poems. These poems are by uh, a veteran who served in the war in Somalia. His name is Mark Harden. He's my Facebook friend. I know him virtually. He mailed this book to me. Um, the first, the first poem um, I'd like to read. I, I, I left this. I hand wrote this and left this at the Korean War Memorial, and it's titled Korean War Memorial. Visit. Only when you are weary of winter and hopeless with fatigue. And then, too, only at dusk, as shadows of the statues sink deep into the abyss to share the dark despair of those desperate souls cast into such a cold Asian hell on the road from Chosen where wind-driven skies of sleet and snow and communist Chinese barreled screaming down nameless numbered ridges and barren hills, slicing through the struggling squads of soldiers, marines, all trapped like apparitions etched on this wall. I'm sorry, like the apparitions etched on this granite wall forever to wait for the false warmth of a bleak sunrise. Korean War Memorial, Mark Harden. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, he dedicated this book and it's the most powerful dedication page I've ever read in my life and I don't know if it's personal, but the dedication page reads, to all who heard the pipes and answered the call, and especially to the veterans of Somalia, you are not forgotten. Mm. So these poems are for the forgotten warriors. This is titled, Don't Look. Don't look, loaded to capacity with fatigued, hollowed, hollow-eyed troopers, the chartered aircraft went wheels up from the Moog Christmas Eve, soaring swiftly away from a debris field littered with abandoned aircraft, tangled, rusting wire, rotting sandbags, <coughs> empty buildings, echoes of slogans, restore hope, leave no one behind. Like a photo of a mirror in a mirror, I sometimes find myself staring at the illusion of it all, the false sense of death, endless reflection. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mark Harden, Losing Mogadishu. Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna do a, I'm going to do a positive one so we can sleep with hope. Because hope is the dope, <laughs> helping us cope. This one's titled CPR, not cardiopulmonary resuscitation, but compassionate people rising. That's how I use CPR. We the people are awake. From us, one hope they cannot break. The warriors do understand. Our tipping point is now at hand. Sleep well, warriors. I'm not leaving until okay. you're finished with writing. Okay. Uh, so you can land on a on a but on a hill by the by the north of town on the, of the beach. There's a giant statue of one arm, one arm Buddha. It's a female figure, the goddess of mercy and compassion. And uh, when I was I uh, spent a lot of time in Da Nang when I was living there in Vietnam. And oftentimes in the morning, I'd go walking along the beach, doing walking meditation, heading towards Quan Am on the hill. And I was always thinking of the Marines who landed uh, very nearby there. And this is uh, China Beach, Da Nang, 2010. I do walking meditation on the golden white sand beach where U.S. Marines landed 45 years ago to start the American War. They came in full combat gear, ready to fight. They were met by smiling Vietnamese girls in Aoyai. The girls gave them flowers. I do walking meditation on this 
golden white sand beach next to the blue East Sea, whose clear warm water gently washes over my feet, I pay attention to each step, each breath, and I am grateful for every moment. I do walking meditation under the wise, loving eyes of giant Wanan. By the way, she's 180 feet tall. Perched on the seaside hill beneath green cloud-tipped mountains. I wish those Marines could be with me, slowly walking this beautiful beach under the eyes of Wanan, healing their hearts and souls. But what I really want to know is, what happened to those smiling girls in Aoyai? How many are old women with husbands, children, and grandchildren? How many are bones in graveyards? How many died in the war, their flowers trampled, burnt to ashes, their white aoyai soaked with blood and tears? I take a few more steps, a few more breaths. Tears come to my eyes, blurring giant one on, on the seaside hill. I realize I will never know what happened to those smiling young girls. I know that they and the Marines will never meet and walk with me on this beautiful beach. But I will come back here tomorrow, light incense and pray for them, then stick the burning incense in the sand. I hope the fragrant smoke will attract their spirits so that they will meet again upon this golden white sand beach under the wise, loving eyes of Wanam and be together in peace forever. Thank you.